you just keep on coming back. I like that. Hi again, kids. Welcome to another fun-filled and hopefully educational video from Eric the Car Guy. Uh, today we have a car that is overheating. Uh, it's summertime here and it's quite common, but also common in the wintertime. So what I'm gonna do is not necessarily fix the car, but I'm gonna go through a process of how to find the cause of the overheat. There are lots of different things on the checklist that you could check off uh, to eliminate possible causes and hopefully eventually find yourself a, a diagnosis in the process. Let's get started. Let's just do one quick note though. Say you're driving along and your car is overheating. What should you do? Well, you should probably find a safe place to pull over and get out of the way of uh, any kind of oncoming traffic, that kind of thing. Uh, but something you can do in the interim is actually turn your heat on. If you turn the heater on, it works like an extra radiator inside your car. Turn the heat on, you roll down the windows, do whatever you gotta do, but uh, that will help bring down the temperature should it be overheating. So just a little tip just to get you by. Now oftentimes the simplest solutions are always the best. Never overcomplicate things when you're trying to diagnose something. Just gather the evidence. Something that you could also check for that's just completely simple is look for any debris, maybe plastic bags or anything like that that might have gotten in front of the radiator or condenser and if that's the case, remove that stuff and you'll allow airflow. If you block the airflow through the radiator, it's a good possibility it could overheat. So don't overlook just looking for debris in front of the condenser or radiator. And as long as you're under here, might as well look for any signs of uh, coolant leakage that uh, you might not be able to see from up top. This I actually think is, since it's over towards the overflow, might be where somebody dumps something because that's actually the transmission. It's not likely that that's leaking coolant. Step one, let's find out if it has coolant in it. But, 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 make absolutely sure you do not take this off when the car is hot. If you do this, uh, you could get severely burned because once, once this cap is pressurized and once you take the pressure off the system, all this stuff can come flying out and possibly burn you. So do not check it here when it's hot. The first place I usually check is in your overflow. And this overflow is really difficult to see um, as far as what's in it. You take the cap off and look down in and it looks like this one is completely and totally full. So it shouldn't be this full, so we're actually gonna to have to take some out of here. It should only be filled up to the, there's a line down on the side there. That's not the reason it's overheating though. But I know for a fact that this engine is stone cold because it's been sitting overnight. So I can just take this cap off without any problem. Now, yuck. There's some goopy yucky stuff down in there. It doesn't look so good. But as you can see, there's coolant all the way to the top. If it's absent, then that uh, could be the problem if you're coolant is gone, then you need to find the source of the leak, whether it's internal, external, or whatever. The next step in the process that I use is I'm going to pressure test the system. Uh, this is a device that attaches to the top of the radiator, uh, and in doing so, you're able to pump it up and put pressure on the system. If there's any leaks in that system, see that fly crawling around my head? If there's any leaks in that system, uh, they will begin to leak under pressure, so it's a good, it's a good valid test to do this. It may require gonna die, fly. It may require special adapters to get between the end of the tester and the uh, radiator itself. Here are a couple, and they have different ends depending upon what type of radiator you have. So you may need to get special adapters in order to do this part of the test. Okay, now we need to fit and decide which uh, adapter and I'm pretty sure it's this one, is going to work. It's uh, actually quite simple. And once you've got that clicked on there, now it's a matter of pumping it up. I hear something coming out, which is probably yes. Actually, I've already found the problem. When I pump this up, you can see the fluid squirting out right there at the top of the radiator. So uh, this one was pretty easy to find, but just in case yours isn't so easy to find, let's go through the rest of the steps for an overheat. Okay, as you've seen here, this leak was fairly easy to find, 
But what you're looking for when you pump up the pressure tester is you want to pump it up to the same pressure that is on the radiator cap. This one says 0.9 on here. And what that means is actually these things are a lot of times measured in atmospheres. But just as a rule of thumb, 15, 16 PSI. Don't exceed that, don't go up to 20. I, I haven't seen an automotive system yet that was above like 17 PSI. And one atmosphere I think is around 15 PSI, just an FYI. Well, as you're pressure testing, what you wanna do is put the pressure tester on, leave it set, and take a look at the gauge. If when you put the pressure tester on, you see a precipitous drop like that, it most likely means there's a large leak or you haven't got it hooked up correctly. So check your connections. Um, and if those are all good, look around for that huge leak. It could, should cause coolant to go down everywhere uh, if it's that large. But if it's a small leak, it may be a little harder to find, but it'll be easier to find because as you see at the top of this radiator neck, it will come spraying out. Now, if the system doesn't have a massive leak, You pump it up to the 15, 16 pound mark and it should pretty much stay there for a significant period of time actually. So if you see something like this, you probably don't have a leak, especially if you come back in like a half hour or so. So what happens if you pressure test the system and you can't find the reason for your overheat anywhere? You can't find any external leaks, that kind of thing. Well, here's the next step and that is to bleed any air out of the cooling system which is covered for the most part in another video. So if you haven't seen that bleeding a cooling system video, you might wanna go there and check. In fact, I might even post a link right here. Okay, enough of that. Next step, bleed the cooling system. Now the reason I bleed the cooling system for the next step is really for two reasons. The first reason is to make sure there's no air in the system. If there's air in the system, it can cause the car to overheat. But the second reason is because I want to verify the operation of the cooling fans. If your overheat happens while you're sitting in traffic but doesn't as you're driving down the road, it's quite possible that it's an issue with an electric cooling fan not turning on like it's supposed to. If it's not moving air through the radiator, then it won't cool the car. But as soon as you start driving, air is moving and it will cool the car. So uh, the next thing I want to do is bleed this out and verify cooling and fan operation. Okay, well, I'm actually ending up replacing the radiator on this car. And as I mentioned, one of the things you want to look for is debris that may be in front of the radiator. Well, sometimes that debris can get lodged between the radiator and the condenser, and while taking out the old radiator, I have something to show you. Take a look at this. You think this blocks airflow? Yeah, I'd say yes. I would definitely say yes. Moral of the story, do not overlook airflow issues because they could just as easily be the cause of an overheat problem as anything as a coolant leak or any other thing that you may think up. Keep it simple and look for debris blocking airflow. I decided to replace the radiator in this car before I heated it up and bled the cooling system out, knowing that I was going to bleed the cooling system out anyway. So here we are after the radiator replacement and now I'm going to bleed the coolant. So at this point, the temperature gauge is a little more than halfway and the cooling fan still hasn't kicked on. We need to figure out why. Now the first rule in diagnosing any kind of electrical problem is don't rule out the obvious. Check the fuses and in this case also check the relays to see if those are good. Okay, here's a 30 amp for the fan. Some other stuff for the headlight. Let's check that out. Now look at that. I don't know if you can see that too well. Yeah. That looks like a good fuse. Let's take it to the ohm meter and see if it works. Now to make quick work of this, I'm going to use my power probe. Somebody actually asked me to do a video on its use. That is an excellent idea, and eventually I hope to, but this will show you how I'm going to use it here to check out the fan circuit. First, you have to hook the leads up to the battery positive and negative. Once you've done that, it allows you to supply power and ground to a circuit. 
but it has this handy pigtail, which is a ground. So a quick check for continuity in something like a fuse is if you just touch the alligator clip to the contact inside there and then touch the other side. If you've got a ground on the circuit, fuse is good. So we can rule out our fuse and plug that back in. But what about this relay? Actually, I need to get something else. Second thing I'm gonna need is my trusty DVOM. I'm gonna set it for the resist end. I'll also do a video on how to use this. But what you're looking for is this little upside down horseshoe looking thing, which basically stands for resistance. My meter is set up to where when you have continuity in a circuit, it will make a noise. And for checking a relay, that's all I need. Now, if you look at the top of this guy, you can see that it's got a diagram there. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to supply power to these, and then this other one over here clicks. Basically, a relay is an electromagnet, and it uses a low current circuit to control a high current circuit. And the way you check it is you supply power to the low current circuit, you listen for the click, but the click doesn't always mean that you've got continuity. That's what the DVOM is for. So, I'm going to hook up my power probe across these two terminals in here, which are one and two, and for five and three, and they've got that little picture up at the top to tell you which one's which. For five and three, I'm going to put my uh, DVOM across it to see if I have continuity after the relay clicks, if it clicks at all. This is my ground for my relay. One and two look like they're on the outer sides. So, and, and usually on relays, the high amp circuit is better metal and the low amp circuit is like the cheap metal. So if you're, if you're wondering which is which, if you, if you see like gold or copper like you see in these, that's usually the high amp side and the low amp side is this other part. So I do have continuity here, so let's see if it clicks. It's clicking. The relay may be okay. The reason why they have relays is because if there is, I'm gonna turn the sound off on this thing, which I can do. Because if there is an issue with the circuit, you're controlling high amp, you're not gonna burn up your switches by using relays. That's why relays are used. Relays are used to use low amperage circuits to control high amperage circuits. So this is kind of tricky, as you will see. Because what I'm listening for here is gonna be my DVOM going beep when I click this. Hear it? This relay is good. Since I can still look or still supply power and ground, first I'm gonna to check to see what I have at the fan itself at this point because I've checked the fuse and the relay. If I'm getting power and ground to the fan and the fan doesn't move, it's quite possible the fan's bad. Now, anybody that works on Toyotas may note that the relay that I just checked is not for the cooling fan of this car. Um, the reason I pulled that relay was because I had found a plastic cover for the relay box that had melted above this particular relay and thought it might have something to do with the circuit not working. Uh, the real cooling fan relay in this car is located next to where I found the fuse. Something else important to note about that particular relay is that it is a normally closed relay, which means it works the opposite of the one that I just showed you. In other words, at rest, that relay is active, and when you activate it, it opens the circuit. So when you test it, it would be just the opposite. When you hook up the uh, DVOM, it'll beep immediately, and when you activate it, it'll stop beeping. That's the way it's supposed to work. Not all relays work in a normally open system. Okay, the connector for the fan is right here. Ow. I'm gonna undo it. And just for the heck of it, I'm going to see if the fan itself can work. Um, as far as power and ground here at the connector, I'm not gonna worry about that so much because I can do everything I need to do with this. And this actually has a circuit breaker in it so that if uh, there's too many amps going through it that uh, it will kick the circuit breaker and not burn anything up. But you can only do this with circuits you know that are 12 volt circuits because this is a direct main line to the battery. So you don't want to supply power to a circuit that's only supposed to get a lower voltage than battery voltage, but cooling fan circuit is a definite. So let's see if we got a ground first. Turn our beeper back on. 
That way we know we have ground. And if we touch this terminal here and we don't see a ground, I have my doubts that we're even going to get it to work at all. We aren't. This cooling fan is dead. So I'm touching it and definitely touching the other terminal, I'm getting a, a ground. But if I don't see a ground here, this cooling fan is burned up without a doubt. Because if this cooling fan was good right now, I would see that and I'd be able to hit it with 12 volts and it should run. I think we pretty much know what's going on with this. Uh, yes, it was the radiator. Uh, yes, it was also a problem with airflow. And yes, the cooling fan burned up. I suspect that it all came from basically the debris that was blocking the airflow through the radiator and the cooling fan was probably running all the time and heated up the relay enough to melt some of the plastic on the cover. Uh, eventually, I think the uh, fan itself got burned out. We'll find out after I put a new one in. Right, now that I'm thinking about it, <clears throat> let's talk about two other things for your overheat problems. Everybody talks about these. This is a thermostat. It is basically a mechanical valve. As this springs, springs, as the spring heats up and cools, it expands and contracts and opens and closes this valve. There are two things that can happen to a thermostat. One is that it can stay stuck closed and either, you know, for whatever reason, it is a mechanical device and over time it will wear out. Uh, if it gets stuck closed, then it won't allow coolant to circulate and you could have an overheat problem. One of the symptoms of this is if the thermostat is stuck closed, your upper radiator hose will probably be really, really hot and your lower radiator hose will be unusually cool. And that usually means that coolant is not circulating through the system. So thermostat, another one. The other thing a thermostat can do is be stuck open and the temperature will never come up to temperature. So in other words, it will open too soon or be open all the time. Um, and, and the other thing is, this coolant temperature is pretty important as far as the fuel injection system goes. So if it's stuck closed or stuck open, it really throws off the fuel system. And you may even get on some uh, later model cars to check engine light. So thermostat being stuck closed or open, uh, stuck closed can cause an overheat. Next on the list and most overlooked, this is the most overlooked thing and probably the easiest thing to, to work with. That's these guys. Yeah, these are both Jap radiator caps, but the radiator cap is huge. And when I say huge, I mean huge. The radiator cap performs three functions. The first function is it keeps pressure on the system. And that pressure is dictated by, um, there's usually some markings. Uh, Europeans and, and Japanese seem to uh, mark them in atmospheres. And this one's 1.1 atmosphere. So this one would be roughly a 16 pound cap. For every pound of pressure that this cap is able to maintain on the cooling system, it raises the boiling point of the coolant two degrees. So if this is a 15 pound cap, it raises the boiling point of the coolant 30 degrees. That's significant. So if this thing fails, the coolant will boil 30 degrees cooler than it would normally without this cap. And that's the other reason why when you take these caps off, where coolant comes shooting out because suddenly it's exposed to the atmosphere. It no longer has a, a, is a pressurized system and it boils immediately. And that's why the stuff comes shooting out and that's why you don't want to take these off when the engine is hot. So very important in that regard. The two other functions are really very similar. This has two valves in it. One valve, when pressure reaches that 15 pounds or whatever, opens up and allows coolant to pass from the top of the radiator through to uh, the overflow tank. Now some systems, granted, some systems don't have an overflow. They have what's called an expansion tank and that is a pressurized reservoir in the system and they work a bit differently. But the radiator cap is still just as important. There's no external tube that leads from the top of the radiator to an overflow. Um, in an expansion tank system it's, it's very different. You see that a lot on Fords. But then, conversely what happens when the, cool, when the car is cold and starts to cool down, this valve opens up and allows the coolant to travel from the overflow back into the radiator and the cooling system topping it off. So it, this radiator cap, not only does it hold pressure and raise the boiling point of the mixture, 
but it takes care of the overflow on some vehicles uh, from the system, both sending it away and bringing it back. Lots of important functions with this radiator cap. I can say that if you go to replace it, replace it with a quality unit. Um, the cheaper ones, of course, are made of cheaper stuff, and cheaper stuff doesn't always function uh, as good as the right stuff. The way a radiator cap may cause an overheat problem is, is really kind of twofold. What I've seen is the valves inside the radiator cap fail and say for instance it will allow coolant to exit the cooling system and go to the overflow but say that valve is bad and it won't suck it back in so over time what it'll do is it'll keep filling up the reservoir but it'll never take it back and if that's the case the coolant will get low and the car may overheat so if you have an overheat because of low coolant and you can't find where it's going after pressure testing and head gasket testing and everything else take a look to see if this valve is okay I've actually seen some cars where this this valve is missing it's gone and Nowhere to be seen. In fact, do I have an example? I knew there was a reason why I keep this junk. Here you go. Here's a very similar radiator cap, and this is all that was left of it when I took it off. So I took it off, and these pieces were just laying down in there. And uh, you know, this could be this could be caused by something else. If the car is overheating for another reason, it can cook these valves. Top of the radiator could get really hot, and bad things can happen. In fact, I think on that Toyota we replaced the radiator on. Uh, the overheat actually cracked the radiator. I think that's what caused it. But yeah, radiator caps, don't overlook them. Now back to you, Eric. Say you go through all this trouble, you don't find any coolant leaks, you bleed the air out of the system, you uh, don't find any external leaks with a pressure tester or anything like that, yet you still have an over overheating problem. There is another possibility, and that possibility is that there's a combustion leak into the cooling system. Sometimes this is a cylinder head gasket failure. Sometimes it's an engine mechanical failure, like say the, there's a crack in the cylinder head or something. You really won't know until you take the engine apart. But in order to diagnose whether or not you have a combustion leak into the cooling system, you can use this, which is a block tester kit. Inside this kit, there are a couple of things. You can find these at most auto parts stores. This, in my opinion, is the easiest way for the do-it-yourselfer to find a combustion leak. And it comes with this little vial right here. And this end is what goes in where the radiator cap is. You don't want to suck up any coolant. So if the coolant's already low and you suspect a head gasket problem, leave it low. Because what you're looking for is the gas. You take some of this tester fluid And you put it into here like so, fill it up to, they have a fill line there. Put the cap on, then you've got this cool little bulb thing with this metal thing on one side and an open end on the other. The open end goes in here. Now you hold this over the radiator opening, try to seal it off as much as possible so that you can suck up the air from inside the radiator. As you do so, and I'll show you a clip here that I have from another video that I shot that I never posted. If this fluid turns from blue to green, or sometimes yellow, that's an indication that there's combustion gases in the cooling system. And in that instance, your engine's gonna have to come apart in order for you to figure out what's actually going on with your overheat. Real sorry about that. This covers the step-by-step, -step, and actually we did find a couple of problems on this car, so it was a real good example. Uh, and, once again, I went through, I fixed the radiator, but then I wanted to verify the repair and see if it was gonna overheat. It's still overheated and I believe we found out why, and that's because the cooling fan has, uh, has gone bad. In summary, first, check for leaks. Number one cause of an overheat problem is low cooling. Find out where it went. Next, make sure there's no air in the system. Um, air may have been introduced for a lot of different things. If you just had like a radiator or water pump or something replaced and now it's overheating, if the cooling system wasn't bled out properly, it's quite possible that there's trapped air in the system. That will now allow it to cool efficiently and cause it to intermittently overheat. Check for air in the system. Next on the list, airflow. Check to make sure that airflow through the radiator is, is clear. If there's like any kind of debris, bags, whatever, that are stuck in your grill or in between the condenser and the radiator like we saw with all those leaves, that's gonna diminish the cooling capacity of the radiator itself and it could overheat because of something like that. In addition to that, make sure your cooling fans are working. If the cooling fans aren't working, it's not going to have air, throw, air flow through the system and as a result could quite possibly overheat. 
Uh, a quick way to check the cooling fans to see if they're working is just turn your air conditioning on if the air conditioning functions. If your air conditioning doesn't have a low charge, it's not going to turn on. But if your air conditioning has the ability to turn on, when you turn on the AC, both the cooling fans should come on. If both cooling fans don't come on, if you have two, then it's quite possible you have a problem there. Lastly, you have the possibility of a uh, combustion leak into the cooling system causing an overheat problem. Also, it will cause cool coolant loss because the coolant will get burned. You may see white smoke coming out of the tailpipe, uh, stuff like that. So, if you've got any of those symptoms and your car is overheating, this is, this is what I do. Uh, you may do something different. Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Eric the Car Guy, always here to help you, the viewer. I thank you ever so much for watching and I hope this information was helpful and will be useful to you in the future. Uh, if you feel inspired by this video in any way and you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button at the end. You can also visit me at ericthecarguy.com anytime. I love visitors. And of course, my classic tagline, be safe, have fun, stay dirty. See you.